morning for you. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Uh, we are here. I am here, and actually, our technical brother uh, uh, EJ Rapata is also here in Korea. So we have a twelve-hour time difference. So it's three a.m. there, while it's two a.m. two p.m. Uh, here. Sorry, three a.m. here, two p.m. there. But we are just our spirit is up and fresh and ready to go. Uh, I wanted to actually, Bishop, we have another speaker again. We've had so many wonderful speakers on this stopping the violence in America. And what are the different resolves that should be put in place or have been put in place to begin to curtail and reduce the violence in America? And it's just not one faceted thing that you would use. Um, one shoe does not fit all. We have to look at the variety of uh, cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, environment backgrounds, all of those things that we're learning through the various people that have come on. We have religious leaders and, and, and uh, political leaders or law enforcement, social leaders, advocates. We've had all on and we are amazed at uh, the different best practices that are out there. And what we believe right now, as we go forward, is that in order to really solve the problem on a national level, eventually we all need to come together and bring our best practices together in one mighty force together. And then I think we will see a national impact. Uh, so each person is that indelibly important. And that is our faith leaders, our law enforcement, those who are concerned, men and women who really want to see the sustainable changes that can be. We're looking at violence so in America. It seems like Bishop is getting worse, you know, and but yet again, that's how the enemy works. He makes you think that as it gets worse, it, there is no change. But you as a faith leader know that uh, throughout the course of history, it always has be, been that way. But somewhere along the line, when we step up, God steps up. And when we step up, history steps up with us. So we just wanted to really greet you and welcome you. I'm going to ask Nadia to read your your um, your uh, bio prior to us, uh, prior to you coming on. <clears throat> but we are grateful uh, to have you. I did read your full story and why I came on at 3 a.m. is that but once, once I read your story, because I was going to have someone substitute to moderate for me, but once I read your story, I said, I got to be there. So that's why I'm here, because I was really impressed and uh, deeply moved by your story. Uh, your We have uh, your topic, and then after I share that, uh, we have Nadia read your uh, bio and then thereafter the floor will be yours murder of a son drives kcmo faith leader to start multifaceted nonprofit. bishop frank h douglas jr is an accomplished preacher and teacher life performance and cognitive <laughs> behavior behavior behavioral behavioral <laughs> And excuse me, intervention coach, 29 years as the founding senior pastor of Beth Judah Ministries Church of God in Christ, bjmlovesyou.org, 15 years has served in the episcopacy, episcopacy of the Church of God in Christ. Bishop Douglas is a native Kansas Cityan received his associate degree from Penn Valley Community College and a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, completed coursework in Greek studies with the Sheffield Bible College, KC, Missouri, and has received two conferred honorary doctorates from Central America Theological Seminary of Kansas City, Missouri, and Southwestern Theological Seminary of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Professionally, 20 years of his career as a logistics supply chain professional with various organizations. Bishop Douglas now provides life performance and cognitive behave, 
Mural Coaching Solutions for Individuals, Groups, Businesses, Colleges, and Correctional Facilities, as well as Churches, under his coach consulting business, the Innovative Seed Group, and the Heart of the Father Initiative, Equipping for Justice Advantage Love, hficares.org. Serves as Regional Financial Director for the Central Region of the Church of God in Christ. Serves as the Financial Director for the Central Region Board of Bishops. Serves on the Board of Bishops Educational Arm as an instructor for ongoing Episcopal and Administrative Assistant Training. Bishop Douglas proudly serves on various national and local organizations from the Ad Hoc Group Against Crime of Kansas City, Community Program Director, Board Member of Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Greater Kansas City, Urban Summit of Kansas City, KPRT, Urban Summit. He is a host weekly on 1590 AM and 106.1 FM, Urban Summit Cell Leader for Governmental Affairs and Elected Officials, Concerned Clergy Coalition of Kansas City, Alpha Point Lions Charter Club member to involvement with communities creating opportunities. And Bishop Douglas is married to his beautiful wife, Lady Carmen. They have six adult children and seven grandchildren. Please welcome Bishop Frank Douglas Jr. Wow, I, I am humbled and honored and uh, God bless you, uh, Reverend Oliver for your kindness. Um, I'm normally up at 3 a.m. my time too, but I'm telling you to be suited and booted and up at 3 a.m. That's quite an honor and to every brother and sister that I don't know, but hopefully in the days that come, you'll understand do not, I'm not a ride and die. I'm a, I'm a ride and live and I'm not a and I, I love you to life. Whoever I have not met yet, I look forward to meeting you. Thank you for your hospitality and such a entry point. And I must just uh, give kudos to Reverend Juan Acosta because it is his persistence. I told him he is like uh, the parable of the neighbor knocking at midnight. And uh, he's been... Um, striving to make this connection for the better part of the first of the year. I uh, am again humbled and I will share uh, my story and parts of my story to the best of my ability. Uh, I want to give this caveat, the, my nonprofit is called Heart of the Father Initiative. And although my son was murdered four years ago and that was the catalyst of it, uh, really taken shape. It had actually been 18 plus years prior to that. I had some tapes of uh, Marvin Winans, and he had about six cassette tapes called The Heart of the Father. And out of it, for those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he, he made the parallel that Jesus come to earth to show us how to have subordination to the Father and celebrate it. And, uh, and so out of that, that was so intriguing to me. And in the world we live in, there is such a need for fathers. And I had, I had an awesome father. And, uh, and so I understand today a whole lot that I didn't understand uh, 10 or 15 years ago. That said, so this had been in my spirit in 48 hours before my son was murdered. I was actually over to his apartment where he and his girlfriend lived and his new four week old daughter. And uh, my custom is the, the grands do not come over to my house for me to, to sit until they are out of diapers. So I, uh, Remember that day going over and uh, talking with him. We talked for about two and a half hours. That was the last time I was to see him. And uh, we talked about two and a half hours. And 
this came up in our conversation, the genesis of what I wanted to do in 2019. Well, I was actually planning for one of our national conferences on the telephone around 2.30 and somewhere between 2.30 on Martin Luther King birthday, January uh, 21, uh, uh, 2019, I got a, a call and uh, it was his it was his girlfriend, but she was hysterically uh, screaming in the phone and I could not make any rhyme or reason. And then I, I got another call about five minutes later from uh, my son Cameron's mother. And she says, something has happened to Cameron. And so my wife and I, we were about 10 minutes from away where he, um, his apartment was. And um, then I thought it to, to call back and uh, Cameron was no more on the earth. And so we were maybe about 80 feet, 100 feet away from Cameron. And um, in his, he was under the yellow canopy as the investigators were doing work. And it was then and for the next two, two and a half hours as we were in, um, I, I say it had to be the temperature somewhere between 25 and 30. And uh, we were just waiting. And um, out there waiting, I learned something about his, his mom. And so my wife and I got there and there's his mom, she was there. And what, what, what we call growing up um, a, um, a day robe. She really had a, didn't even, wasn't really suited and booted for the weather. And she said something very starking to me. She said, Frank, we were not here when our son uh, took his last breath on the earth. We're not going anywhere until he's up off that ground. And um, it, it says something to me about a mother's love that's slightly different than a father's love. And I was trying to look at, you know, get her protected out of the elements. But I understand and understood where she was coming from. For brothers and sisters, what I have learned in this journey that the difference between a father and a mother is a mother has nine months before the world has nine months of being with the child, the child is within her and the child uh, develops under that heart of that mother. That being said, my son was killed as a result of him actually literally being in his mother's car and coming down a street, a narrow street on a, in an apartment complex where there was poor security and uh, the perpetrator uh, pulled out, uh, pulled his door out in an, on a narrow, and, it, and that's what really started this terrible and fatal uh, tragedy that he opened the door and it, it was a deliberate action. And it caused my, my son to go to the car and they had words and uh, it, it's, it's been aired on KCPT um, here locally. So it's out there on the internet. I feel like people ought to see uh, what anger and hatred can do. And then uh, for about less than 15 seconds, uh, he, he claimed my son had, he felt my son was threatening uh, and he, he must have said something. My son turned around and he began to shoot at my son. Um, six bullets from his Glock uh, landed and the fatal shot was to the back of my son's head. He was probably 30 feet from my son. And so it suggests to me he shot, he was shot a, a, a handgun before. Nonetheless, we go through, we went through much in that time, even though I worked, I work even today still with ad hoc group against crime here locally, which deals with uh, violence in the city, not just um, uh, murders, but it, it deals with just violence. Uh, 
uh, as, as it relates to the urban community here in Kansas City. And um, I teach in the jails as well as in uh, treatment centers, uh, a program called Thinking for a Change. And so I was uh, really conflicted. This was another chocolate man that had shot another chocolate man. And uh, so there was confliction, but there is also what I have learned in the process is the need for justice, even as a Christian, uh, I owe it and I owed it to his daughter. And um, this was the rationale in which I moved in the two and a half years. Mind you, this happened about a year before COVID, but this was what um, I asked God at his scene, do not let my son's murder get uh, less justice than Michael Vick did for his improper behavior with dogs because I didn't want my son's life to be worth less than a dog. So that was an impetus that drove me through this process. Through the process of that two and a half years, I, I have a better understanding of how the court system works. The court system um, is very collegial to defense attorneys. And uh, it's just the nature of the way uh, here within at least Missouri, uh, the laws are. And I, and I learned that a family has really no rights because the, the, uh, it's the state's case. And so that was a very shocking reality about a month later after his murder when we went to pretrial. It took us, because of COVID, almost a thousand days to bring his case to trial. That's extremely difficult on a family. So in the process of me forming Heart of the Father, there was a need I already felt because of work I do in the community where there's gaps in, in, in silos in the community of how one agency works or coordinates with another. So I'm so intrigued, uh, Reverend Oliver, uh, because of some of the things you said prior to us uh, going live to just find out more about this organization and uh, it sounds so beautiful, uh, the research I've done on this organization. Nonetheless, that's what I felt like, it, that there's agencies that are not talking to agencies and uh, the strength of real true advocacy is missing for the family. And so surviving families go through so much and uh, I've learned a lot about trauma. I, I learned that I really have had a traumatic life but growing up in the urban core, uh, it, it has been uh, normed. And that's unfortunate that for many people that trauma has been normed. And then there are different other echelons that not just deal with racism, but classism along the way. And so I had already had the heart of the father as something in me, just, you know, knowing that I'd already talked 48 hours earlier to my son. Now, um, uh, out of that, uh, the, what was birth was what I called at that time, Project Relentless, because I know that it, for that two, two and a half year period when a family is trying to go from not just healing, but trauma, justice, there are a lot of gaps and holes in current processes so that a family really is always in a reactionary mode. And so um, it started out again as Project Relentless, but as I'm healing now, brothers and sisters, I needed to change and rebrand that because what I found is that there are, are four basic ways that many of us respond to trauma. Some of us fight, then there's a term flight. Then there's the term uh, uh, where we, we operate in fear. So we just go undercover. 
And then there's FAWN, F-A-N-N. That means we just become a doormat. And, and so where I found myself was in flight. And so I want you to understand flight is not exactly what I thought flight was, but flight was if, if you feel like you're tempted to fight, but you know that is not the, gonna produce the right result because of, um, at least for me, the Christian Judeo principles, which I live by. Mind you, I tell people this, and some people believe me and some didn't. I've never held a handgun. I didn't say that I've never been around one. I said, I've never held a handgun. I don't own a handgun. Uh, it was not conducive in my upbringing. It does not mean I don't understand uh, why some people are gun holders. And so, but I, I never held a handgun. It was not promoted when I was married to Cameron's mother. We in the household, we did not let our children play with even toy guns. Even at Cameron, one of his last part-time jobs, he, he was working at uh, what we call a convenience store where you know, liquor and things are sold and, and you get gas. And he had to quit the job because he was a, uncomfortable having to have a handgun working late at night. That was just one of the requirements of him working late at night. So that was etched in, in, in my children's psyche as well as mine from my father for whatever reason. And so um, I am not uh, anti-gun but I believe my son would probably still be here if there was gun education, gun training. Uh, the lethality of guns um, from start to finish, whether you're talking about uh, a handgun, in a handgun, uh, 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 the, the bullets travel about at 850 uh, feet per second. Uh, but the lethality there is slightly different than in a military grade gun, which is generally a rifle that is, um, which moves about 2,500 uh, feet per second. And then the lethality of the size of um, that bullet or um, cartridge uh, makes a lot of difference on um, skin wound or skin injury and tearing up tissue of a person's body. I believe we're in a reckless moment in our culture because of how we promote guns from every aspect of the television and media, games. I believe all of them play a contributing factor to the level of violence because many children go uh, and recreate and play paint guns or rifles. And so they get the sense of a power and they get a sense of a power without responsibility. I believe that when I transitioned you all and uh, consequently my son's uh, murderer received six years. Wouldn't have gotten six years had it not been for our vigilance as a family. I understand also brothers and sisters restorative justice, but there is a word that has been around for a long time and it has a lot of misunderstanding, especially in the American culture right now called reparations. Reparations is a term that come really out of the 1850s, eight, the early 1800s, when say a farmer in an agricultural society, maybe two farmers, uh, a, a bull tore up the fence or even maybe an accident injury uh, that caused trauma or even uh, caused death, instead of uh, a judicial system getting in the middle of it, those two families would come together and speak of, in the name of peace, how do we bring repair? So really reparation means about 
how to bring repair as uh, the um, Hebrew word for peace is to, to, to make a new covenant, which is shalom, which is to bring back a reparation to a place where nothing's missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. And so it's the broken peace that families really deal with. Uh, during the time that we were trying to go to trial um, and when we were told how difficult it was going to be uh, for us to get uh, the modicum of justice that we were seeking, it broke uh, Terry Cameron's mother's heart. And uh, I do believe 60 days later, she did not necessarily just succumb to COVID, but 60 days earlier when we were dealing with pretrial discussion with the, um, the judicial system and um, they flattened our expectation, I believe it tore her heart apart and maybe even her will. Uh, and so during that time, you all was a fighter and I, I want you to understand that gun violence can affect you in so many ways that it can even uh, challenge your character. And I remember being at a place uh, in um, August of 2020, which is about a year and a half after Cameron's murder. And you contemplate uh, seeing that person and even maybe what type of retribution you would have toward that person. And I had a, a relative and he literally told me at, a, at an outing, at an outdoor outing, cousin, I can take care of him for you. And it was the first time I had a reality of maybe how the other person is thinking that is dealing with um, the cusp of hatred going from just evil and wickedness to going over that line. And uh, I, was, I was floored for him even making that. He said, now, I'm going to go to jail, maybe go to prison for life, but you're hurting so badly. I just wanted you to know how much I love you. And I had at least, uh, his mother, Terry, and myself had at least eight people that come into us in various ways to make that same offer. And for me, it would make me no better than the person that murdered my son. And so it was never an option, but it's just to tell, just to share with you the tremendous pressures that come for a, a surviving family that is dealing with this kind of loss. So I'm making it my life's business to, uh, uh, we've converted it from Project Relentless to equipping for justice. And I believe that's coming out of me not being pensive and not having the same anger and have had a, a, a time of some level of healing. And so what I realize that, that when a child is taken from an apparent, I don't care if the child is a young adult, or an adult, um, it changes the life of the parents, especially because the, the natural order is that we go first. It allows that, that parent also to do a lot of reflection, maybe even have guilt about that process. And for me, for several months, I was uncertain if I was on the scene, what could I have done? But what I do know is God is merciful that in this particular instance, my son's uh, trauma allowed him to be quickly relieved from pain. So he did not suffer from that head injury aside from he, his, his light was snuffed out. So I made the other commitment during the process of that week as we were prepare, preparing to funeralize Cameron 
that one day, brothers and sisters, I know his daughter, Milani, is going to ask her poppy this one question. Did you do everything within your power to get justice for my father's death? I didn't say vengeance. I said justice. I didn't say retribution. I said justice. And I believe I can live, and I asked God at that moment also, that would he give me, extend to me, some at least 25 more years so I can be able to answer that adult granddaughter one day. Now, Heart of the Father has four aspects to it. Dealing with fathers, I believe that we have so many mentors that we have ser serrated into the role that the fathers should have, where we need to equip the father. And so I'm about making the father become dedicated to the role. And I have fathers that say to me, brothers and sisters, I can't get along with uh, their mother. I said, you did for 15 minutes. So now let's do your best act to understand that you want to make your number one fans your children. And be, to do that, if, you're, if the mother has the custodial uh, guardianship, then she's going to have to become your number one customer. And so when you make her your number one customer, you will reestablish what these three R's are, which is relationships require respect. And then uh, secondly is the equipping for justice in which I believe we're here today. And I believe that every family should get justice. Now justice may look a little different to every family. I don't believe necessarily the boy that, that killed my, my son was 21. My son was 23. And so uh, my son, loses a lot. He loses a lot. I don't necessarily believe in retribution where this boy has to suffer, but I do believe that justice should, should and has occurred. They were going to take his three years, give him three years and three years and run them concurrently. But then we showed some video that he had placed out on social media that he was actually mocking the judicial system. He was actually admitting to what he had done. And uh, because of that, we were able to get them to, to not run concurrent, but at least six years. Now that's far lower than what we anticipated. But nonetheless, in Kansas City, there are men and women walking around that had Perpetrators and murderers did not got one day behind bars for that heinous crime. Now, I know some don't see necessarily, you know, forgive. I've forgiven him. I have forgiven him, brothers and sisters. However, justice is an aspect of God's grace as well. Here is Jesus, and this is where I'll, I'll stop. And if uh, whatever questions may be offered, uh, Reverend Oliver, here's Jesus between two thieves. And uh, Jesus offers grace. And he says, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. But what Jesus did not do is alter the consequence that brought the three of them together. And justice was served, but grace was given also. So I believe there is two truths where justice can be um, enacted and grace can be enacted. And I believe when we talk about peace today, I believe that's why everyone all over the world is together right in this moment. When we talk about peace, we have to we have to lean on the Apostle Paul who said, sin does abound, evil or wickedness does abound. And sometimes it seems like there's more uh, wickedness 
than grace. That's only because we're looking through the lens of hopelessness. But when we look through the lens of hope, then we're able to say, just like the Apostle Paul, wherever sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Brothers and sisters, grace still does abound much more. It is commendable. Everything that everyone is striving to do that's on this webinar, God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my story. I am also a practicing uh, person that takes trauma therapy. Therapuso is the Greek word out of the Bible that stands for layers of healing. If any of you all are dealing with traumatic situations similar to mine that have come as a result of gun violence, do not try to go it alone. God has put beautiful men and women on the planet to help us to get the layered healing that we deserve. Remember, gun violence consequences are abnormal situations and your body was not designed to hold in the pain or grief that you may be experiencing. God bless you and thank you, Reverend Oliver and, and everyone else. Wow, thank you, Bishop Douglas. Uh, I am just floored by your, your presentation, your insights, and most importantly, your heart. Uh, you hear the heart of the father. And as you had said, the mother is, uh, I'm always marveled of my wife, you know, when it mm -hmm. comes to our, our, our daughter. Mm -hmm. They are like lioness, you know? It's amazing, you know? The, and I was thinking the other day that uh, in one aspect, women are more powerful than we are. In another aspect, we're more powerful than, so we complement one another. But us men, we can recognize that power, you know, when she's standing up in there. Now, I know what you were talking about. Put them house shoes on. And if you get one on, that's good enough. If you get two that's on, it. you're doing great. But, you know, and they rush out that door with the robe and they will stand there for the sake of their child and they don't feel anything, you know. So I, I can feel the power of the mother. And of course, you were saying the heart of the father, which you just shared too, was powerful because. You don't. I love what you said. We're not looking for vengeance. Vengeance is mine, thus said the Lord. That's it. What we're looking for is, I think I heard you word you said previous restorative justice, yes. because you need to pay the price of what you did, but also you need to be restored as well. Mm -hmm. And the restorative justice, where I heard it listening to you, was that we 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 without without the justice that is restorative, then we're not taking or fulfilling our push responsibility. You have to be responsibility. I like what you said. Power without responsibility is dangerous, you yeah. see. And so we have given in our society, right, this whole sense of power with this gun. We we glamorize the gun, as you see. You, you watch every movie. If they're not saying the F word, they're saying <laughs> they're pulling out guns and it's almost glam it's, it's, it glorified. It's, it's yes. you, you know, it's, it's glamour. You see what I mean? So that means that I give you power, but you have no responsibility. You see, wow. that is where the danger really lies. I You said so much today that I was really moved by your your heart. And um, also we have a saying in our in our in our in our ministry. Uh, uh, the heart of the father and the shoes of the servant. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you yes. see. Yeah. So uh, last week, on last week, we had another speaker and he was talking about fathers in the school. Yes, sir. And one of the things he was sharing, how powerful also the power of the presence of a father. That's it. Yeah. So that could tell ill behaviors and he he saw some transform transformative paradigm shift in the attitudes of the kids the guys that have a gun they just had a coach stripes and they just walked around 
but the power of the father, that male, like that bull elephant can walk around. Right. Makes it different, you know, and a <laughs> lot of, go ahead, Bishop. Uh, and, and Reverend, Reverend Oliver, this is what I have learned out of that. And I've seen a couple of chat things in brothers and sisters. I've got obligations for the next four hours, but after them four hours, if uh, any of my information, if we can connect, I'm fine with. But I, I was going to say, uh, through my being a lover of learning that my parents instilled in me, I've got a different definition of what a mentor is. Uh, so a window is symbolic to show you something outside of the room you're in. So let's, let's call that an opportunity. But a door gives you access to that opportunity. And a mentor is anyone that can open a door for you that you cannot for yourself. Now, what we have been programmed, at least I was programmed to look for role models and ask them to be mentors. But the other caveat is a mentor has to see potential in you, not you in them. And so they see where you're striving to go. And then if you're committed, they will work with you to open the door. That was the design that God had when Hadem and Eve were in the garden. That the fruit of their labor uh, of being fruitful and, and multiplying would challenge them to mentor new life mm -hmm. in the image yes. of in the image of God. Amen. You know, Bishop, what 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 also what you just you said, and I wanted to open up before let others say a few words, is uh, uh, one of my opening statements that I usually share is that it's not, as you said, you're not against guns. And what we say, I say, is the gun is an inanimate object. The just like kind the stone, just like the stone between Cain and Abel. Yeah. That's right. And what kind of trauma uh, has perpetuated, or is the origin of that person to pull that trigger? We have to begin to look at that. As is, and so this trauma is different. You mentioned, you know, traumas from this historical traumas that people have not dealt with. You know, there's. Uh, media trauma, trauma that just happened. Yes. You know, all of those things, follow, they, they follow you and we have not found or dealt with those healing processes. And I think we can uh, begin to uh, begin to reduce the ill behaviors that we do yes. see out of our children. Um, it's, it's, it's in every day, Bishop, I, 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 I just look at the internet every day, especially in our community, there are four or five kids just that shot each other for, you know, we need to deal with that. We really and, need and to if deal they, with And that. if they have gone to five gun training sessions, that outcome would have been different. We ju I just know it. Just on how to handle the gun, the responsibility of a gun holder, and the proper way to use a gun. Because it, it then not only is having empowerment, but there is an accountability that comes with those that have the gun. So that's not just, that's not just youth, that's, that's adults too. Yeah, but that goes back to the, the heart of the father. Accountability does not come osmosively. It comes yes. to a learning and it comes to us. Uh, I, I like what you said about mentor. Someone may, they, you know, a mentor sees something in you. Your parents see something in you, and they encourage that piece. And that piece is what becomes your catalyst for better behavior yes. and more confidence. So I really appreciate you. I just wanted to, Bishop, you, um, have let you say closing remarks as well, because you didn't finish three and four. Uh, you said one, two, but you didn't. Uh, so my ears are still perked for three and four. So, but we we will <laughs> we will uh, 
ask just anyone before you share that, uh, anyone that has some questions or uh, any statements that they would like to uh, share before the bishop finishes the three and four. See a hand up, maybe let me check. If not, Bishop, why don't you go and share with us the, the three and four? I know you said uh you, you you know you started with the 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 father's role and how they equipped him to be more responsible and uh, dealing with his wife and equipped, you know, with justice, but you didn't do three and four. Okay. This is both man and woman. Uh and so I'll just deal with the the the, the father. A father has two phases to his life that are brought, and in both phases, there's three stages. Baby, boy, man is the first phase. And he does not even know when he enters into the next phase until his parents or people that are his garden make awareness. I can remember being around eight or nine and um, I ran through the house and my mother said, boy, you're a little spicy. We're going to have to start doing a different kind of washing up and bathing. And so she was telling me that there was a transition coming. That's what I can remember today. That's what I can remember today. I didn't understand that at the time. But in that one, as I said, someone else is responsible for making you aware that you're going, you're transitioning to the other stage. The second is uh, when you are now an adult is husband, father, elder. If we get father ahead of house band, house cover, then you're going to possibly become a problem maker for the child instead of a problem solver. And the, the greatest gift God can give a father is to allow he to see his children's children to have influence on two generations. To nurture not only the father of his grandchild, but to also nurture directly and indirectly the grandchild. And I believe that was really the genesis of what we see when we're looking at um, the, the parable between the talents. Talents represented 20 years of ability to provide. So one had five, one had two, and one had one. The one with five went to Wall Street and put the five and, and doubled it. And now technically could influence 10 generations. The one with two was what most of us are able to do is influence two generations after us, but had enough common sense to, to mark the perfect model that God has put before and just practice the same principles and doubled it now has the ability to bless four generations. The one with one had enough really to have been a general contractor and worked for 20 years and get a child from Pampers to a diploma, but chose to bury and be ashamed of the one talent they had. And if they would have, if they would have just followed um, what they saw before them, they could have at least been able to be a contributive factor to their grandchildren, but they chose to negate their responsibility. So that's what makes them a problem maker instead of a problem solver. And I also believe if, if the men that come into our program, if they were not, if they don't have the opportunity to be awesome fathers, they can become some awesome grandparents. There is redemption in life. There's many a people that they were so busy trying to make income, wealth, and finances that they were they were not really providing fatherhood. So it works uh, both ways. But the other two programs we have also is Innovative Seed, 
which does deal with a, a saying I have, first downs make touchdowns, touchdowns make wins, but don't forget to huddle. In American football, you got to have a little meeting after every milestone. And so it's about helping people better communicate with one another. Then our fourth offering is called Advantage Love, a term out of tennis. And it's about how premarital coaching uh, for men and women that will marry. And so that's those are the, as my sister Nadia so adequately said, we are a multifaceted nonprofit. And th those are the what we offer to our community and to the world. Thank you, Bishop. That was profound. Actually, our ministry is the power of the family, is the power of finally bringing true justice and also bringing true harmony in the world. And when you break down the family, you break down the community, you break yes. down the society, you break down morals and ethics right. because it's through the, the, the parental you know, passing on is where the morals and ethics and the samples, the, not sample, but the examples of that is passed down from generation to generation. And as you know, as you're a biblical scholar, I can see, uh, you know, the first discussion that God had was with Adam and Eve. So already he dealt with a man and a woman. And the first murder was between two brothers, you see. So somehow in the family structure is where the decay of humanity began. And but even, when the, even when the contempt, Reverend Oliver, when contempt was found in Cain's heart, God fathered him in the garden and put his arms around him and still told him how he could correct. But hatred was so strong and immense. And there's a difference between brothers and sisters, jealousy and envy. Jealousy is I want what you have. Envy is I want what you are. I want to trade places with you. And so the envy is what he was, the spirit of envy. He wanted to trade places. He wanted to be exhorted by God without doing how God asked in the order. I agree with you 1000%. I always share this, Bishop, is that that was a soliloquy that God shared with him. God was actually coaching and you ever That's heard it. God coach? God was coaching his son. And you heard what Absolutely. he said. I understand why you feel this way. <laughs> but we're in a paradigm situation. We're in a, a catch-22 position. Yes. I need you to understand. I need you to go over a little bit here. And because it desires you. It has a desire for you for some reason. You're a catalyst for it. But if you yes. go over me and daddy, you and my dad, we will win over the enemy. But like you said, that thing was too strong in him that he couldn't hear the coaching that God gave him. So I agree with you 100%. Uh, and God has been coaching us through the prophets. Yes, and, absolutely. And throughout the course, course of history. So I really love what you just said, Bishop. And, ho um, and hopefully and we, we uh, those of us that seek peace, uh, Half of my, most of my adult life, at least for 35, 40 years, I've sought the pathway of not just Gandhi, but the Thoreau before him, and uh, then uh, Martin King, and the astonishing uh, move of God that his father going to Germany, their names were Michael, but when he saw what peace really looked like he he chose to change his name to Martin Luther. Yes then, he, yes. then he asked his son, who was his namesake, would he and his son did not do it immediately, but his son learned the the intent of what his father was trying to symbolize. Peace. Peace. Think, right? It's amazing. Yeah, the history and in, in, in the power even the power of suggestion right through the yes, father, yes, correct? Yes, so yes. I, before before I would like just, we have like four minutes. I would like, anybody would like to say one, one word. If not, then I will, Bishop, give you just like one minute, two minute closing remarks. Yes. 
anybody else have a question uh they would like to share some things i didn't see let me see what's in here you know a few people are just shared it and i agree with them uh there was a wonderful definition of mentor the one who sees the potential in one and who opens the door to their opportunity to grow that's a change a lot of a lot of kids do not go through that right a lot of kids are are, are beaten down you're, you're not nothing you know that kind of thing yeah. so uh but uh well a lot of those kids are if they were i always say a, a lot of them bishop if they were m- mentored right many of them are walking geniuses but they just never had an opportunity to you know expand that embellish upon already their greatness and anything but now i like your reparations too uh, as you said, reparation is how to bring repair. It, that's what it really is. It's not just retribution. Give me some. It's about repairing, uh, repairing even a relationship, you right. know, that was severed. Repairing the breach. B- repairing the breach is really powerful. So I don't see anyone. Um, oh, oh, there's Wayne Hankins. Hey, brother. Wayne, did you want to say something? Hi, good morning. Good morning. I I truly appreciate your mentioning of a father, the importance of fathers, and that is a that is a major problem that in our country. But I'd like to hear your thoughts as to what are the things that brought this on, and what are the what are the practical things we can do to repair it. Well, uh, fifteen. Well, no, my mom's been. She's been deceased since 89, so that's almost 34 years ago. About 30 years ago, I have a friend, his, his father literally uh, fought for, for German as a teenager uh, in the Nazi uh, army, and, uh, and he became a Lutheran pastor. And, and Hans Fritz, he, you can almost identically look like Hans Fritz, my brother, as I'm looking at you your, your, with your pretty vanilla smile there. And uh, so I was over his to one of the rental places his father owned it, that my friend Peter stayed in. He came up to Peter. So it was not a part of my culture, brother, brother uh, Wayne. And he kissed Peter, who is a 24-year-old or a 25-year-old. It wasn't a part of my culture. It made an indelible mark on my life. I went and talked to my father about it. I said, now, I don't know that we're going to start kissing now. <laughs> but we're going to leave every conversation since my mother's not there to be that glue anymore. We're going to have to leave it with a, I love you. So for the rest of my life, and my father said it like this to a son, if it seemed like I wasn't affectionate enough and it seemed like I was kicking you before now, just remember I was kicking you forward. So I, I remember that part of the conversation. <laughs> but, so he had the stern piece, but the affection wasn't there. And from that moment on, we'd either embrace one another or we would say, I love you, phone call or in person. And from that moment on, as I was raising my children, now all my children know I kiss them. And then it's one thing to get a mama's kiss, but it's another thing to get kissed by father. So, and, and so when we have relationship to that degree, and, and I also say this, uh, uh, Brother Wayne, people say, they'll tell you their belief but value is the price tag of your belief. If you really value your children, then they ought to know it. And, and so it's, it's, it's mine now. My purpose, uh, Brother Wayne, is this is, my, this is the purpose I've, out of the time of the tragedy for my son to now, this has come my purpose, to help others discover their genius and remove the barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne, for that question. Uh, Bishop, thank you so much for uh, your profound uh, gushing and sharing your heart and the story that God brought you through 
And now you've become a catalyst for others. Yes. And in, in their healing process. Yes. And that's what this webinar is all about. I see. And we want to bring, eventually I keep saying it, but you, when y'all wake up in the morning, you're going to see, we're going to have a huge national conference and bringing the best I practices believe it. together. I believe it. I believe and, it. And we're going we're gonna to, you know, God told me one time, so look over the city. And he said, well, we're going to take it by storm. So we're yes. going to take it by storm. You know what I mean? I, one I believe day. it. I yes, believe sir. It. I and appreciate anyone, it. And anyone that need my information, you all are, you, you are, are Nadia, are free to share my, my, inf my contact. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, we can put that on the, um, Nadia or someone can put it on a text or they can call Nadia. They can call myself to move forward. And I look forward to talking with you again. Yes. And thank you so much for sharing your, 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 your deep hearted story and, and uh, I love that piece. This is a very powerful piece, the heart of the father, you know, and uh, remember this one, but the heart of the father has to be in the shoes of a servant. And see, yes, Jesus was that. Yes, the, dolos, <laughs> the, dolos, the, run, the runners, the runners in the time of ancient Greece, the marathon, you would know who, who were enslaved to love because their feet were dusty. <laughs> thank you so much i God really bless everybody it. thank you for I, this opportunity today absolutely i appreciate your deep wisdom as well so, all right everyone god bless you uh thank you again for coming on everyone those who come faithfully and of course we're live uh on youtube and many people are also watching uh bishop douglas god bless you oh uh, Cameron's mom, uh, did was she overcome by? Uh, yes, she, she, COVID? she succumbed. She succumbed to COVID. Okay, and, I just and that was to just during the part. That's you know that's a another time to speak about what happened in our yes. trial from that point to that. But uh, oh my God, yeah, yeah, just just pray for us and um, those who can. If if you want to make a difference, make a contribution to F. F H F I cares, whatever it is, it'll help us help some men and women in this community. What is it again? Just H F I cares, which is standing for Heart of the Father Initiative. F, I mean H F I cares dot org. All right, if everyone got that, uh, if yeah. not, if they need to come back through Lania yeah. or so, yeah. we'll be more than happy. God bless you, uh, uh, uh Bishop. And uh, I know the Cameron spirit is with you and um, I can feel, you know, that, uh, you know, it's all he's good. proud of you. He's proud of his dad. It's all good. It, it's love all good. All life. Yes. Don't love, don't love Bishop De Douglas to death. Love me to life. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. <laughs> I like that. All right, everyone. God bless you again. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Bishop Douglas, for your 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 powerful testimony and the powerful work that God has working through you to accomplish for the sake of others. Lord, God bless continue, you. Continue to be a force for Reverend Oliver on the earth, that the atmosphere be ready for what he and the cohorts that make up this federation are striving to do in the name of peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> God bless. All right, everyone. God bless you. Thank you so much for that, Bishop. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Bishop Douglas. Thank you, my friend, Brother William. God bless. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Juan, thank you so yeah. much. For God it. bless you, dear yeah. Bishop. Yeah. God bless. Thank you, sir. Bless thank you. you. Bless you. Bless you. Peace be unto you all. Take care, everyone. Thank you, uh, EJ. EJ is here in Korea with me, the technical guy. <laughs> wow. Awesome. And, yeah. Awesome. So I'm signing came. off, y'all. I got two more classes to teach. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sign off. God bless you. Bye, everyone.